everyone for coming tonight, and we're so excited to see so many people interested in our Nukebusters short film contest. My name is Teresa Schaefer, and I'm the Security Outreach Associate for Physicians for Social Responsibility. I'll be emceeing the webinar tonight, and our main speaker will be Martin Fleck, Security Program Director for PSR. Just to give you a quick breakdown, the webinar will last about an hour, and all attendees will be muted in order to avoid any technical problems. We'll address any questions you have at the end of the presentation, and we'll unmute you at that time. This webinar will be recorded and saved to our Newsbusters page at PSR.org, so don't feel like you have to jot every detail down. Let me just quickly go through the agenda, and then I'll hand it over to Martin. Um, Martin's going to start with an intro to Physicians for Social Responsibility. Then he's going to dive into the nuclear weapons basics, such as how many nuclear weapons there are, which countries have them, etc. Then we're going to talk about the three film contest categories, which are economic, health, and faith. I'll go over the contest details, uh, several resources that you can use, and then we'll open up our Q&A session. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Martin. Thanks, Teresa. Um, I want to say hi to everybody, and good for you for being intrepid listeners uh, coming in on Nukes 101, a webinar for Nukebusters. I'll start by um, talking a little bit about our organization, Physicians for Social Responsibility. Who are we? Physicians for Social Responsibility works to reduce the gravest risks to human health. So right now, uh, in 2015, that means we're working on climate change and we're working on nuclear weapons. We were founded in 1962, and we've grown to have 35,000 e-activists in all 50 states. We also have a student PSR organization for med students, and we have 21 chapters of PSR around the country. Many, but not all, of our members are health professionals, and I want to emphasize that you do not need to be a health professional to be a part of PSR. So. For NUCS 101, the idea behind this webinar was uh, to provide some basic information for those of you who are interested in making a film about nuclear weapons issues. Uh, and we're hoping that we'll provide you with some interesting ideas uh, about what's going on with nuclear weapons. Um, we're going to be flying through a very basic overview of the nuclear weapon situation. I know a lot about this stuff. I've been working on this all my adult life, uh, but I'm going to keep it to skimming over the top of these issues. We're not going to go in very deep. So during World War II, uh, the aerial bombardment of cities became rather commonplace. And during that war, the United States embarked on a crash program to create an atomic bomb. That was called the Manhattan Project. Once we had the bomb, we used it. And this put the world on a path that leads to where we are today. PSR advocates for the world to recognize that this path is a dead-end road and that globally we need to get onto a different path. And we'll be talking about um, what we have in mind and what people around the world are working on uh, a little bit later in this presentation. So with the New Clusters short film project, we're asking you or any filmmakers you know to help us put the world onto that different path. That's the path to a nuclear weapons free world. So let's fast reverse back to 1945. On August the 6th, August the 6th of 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan, and 70,000 people were killed within 30 days most of them within the first moments of that bomb going off. And this is what it looked like on the ground in Hiroshima shortly afterwards. Three days later, we dropped another atomic bomb on Nagasaki, which killed 40,000 people within the first 30 days. So what was different? Uh, I wanted to say that's it, by the way. That is the sum total of nuclear weapons that have ever been detonated uh, in a wartime situation. So thank goodness for that. Um, those were bad enough. So what was new about the atomic bomb? 
uh, this time, instead of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of planes carrying bombs and bombing cities, one plane carrying one bomb could destroy an entire city. Another thing that was different is radiation effect. Um, the radiation effect caused deaths and illnesses long after the bombing, so there were lingering uh, casualties. All told, the estimates for Hiroshima range from 90,000 to 166,000 died from the bombing. And in Nagasaki, the estimates range from 60,000 to 80,000 people. So after the United States did this, um, other countries were interested in also getting nuclear weapons. And they proceeded to figure out how to make them. Uh, and so this is a chart of who joined the nuclear club and when. And you can get this information at the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. So the United States uh, detonated our bombs in 1945. The Soviet Union got the weapon in 1949. That's now Russia. Uh, Great Britain in 1953, France in 1963, China, oh, excuse me, France in 1964, China also in 1964, Israel in 1967, although they have never admitted that they actually have a nuclear arsenal, um, India in 1998, Pakistan also in 1998, and North Korea in 2006. So that's the sum total of the nations of the world. There's about 200 nations in the world. Nine of them are armed with nuclear weapons. Now on this chart, it's a little frightening because um, uh, because there was there were some amazing numbers that piled up. There it is. In 1986. 64,449 nuclear weapons in the world. That was the high point, and I'm happy to say that the numbers of nuclear weapons have gone way down since then. Back then, the nuclear weapons were not as accurate, so people, uh, they wanted to hit targets with many nuclear weapons, and they wanted to hit targets with big nuclear weapons. So um, the Cold War era officially ended after the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. The Soviet Union dissolved at the end of 1991. Uh, and all of the Soviet nuclear weapons came back to the Russian Federation. And frankly, it seemed as though the era of the United States and uh, Russia pointing these nuclear weapons at each other had ended and that we didn't need to worry about nuclear weapons so much anymore. But the nuclear weapons did not go away. And this is how it looks today. Um, the numbers are Russia has 7,500, United States 7,100, China 250, France 300, the United Kingdom 215, Israel maybe 80, that's an estimate, India maybe 95, Pakistan maybe 100, and North Korea less than 10. So it adds up to as of March of this year, around 15,650 nuclear weapons in the world. So we need not to think that uh, the nuclear weapons issue has gone away. In fact, they're very, still very much with us. In the United States, we currently maintain these three different kinds of um, nuclear weapons. Actually, there are several different kinds. But we have something called the triad. So the nuclear weapons are based on land-based missiles, on bomber airplanes. This is a picture of a B-2. Uh, and on these submarines, triad submarines, that can actually launch the missiles from underwater. Amazing, but it's true. Uh, the B-52s carry a variety of, uh, the B-52s and the B-2s carry a variety of different weapons, including gravity bombs and cruise missiles. We also have some tactical nuclear weapons that are um, based in Europe. So the idea here is that uh, we have a, all every kind of different weapon that you can imagine, and it would be very difficult to take them all out. Now, realizing that, um, there, that nuclear weapons were spreading to other nations uh, in between 1968 and 1970, um, most of the nations of the world came together and negotiated the non nuclear non-proliferation treaty. 
And this was a grand bargain where the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states made a deal with each other. The countries that didn't have nuclear weapons that signed the treaty agreed that they would not pursue getting nuclear weapons. In return, the five nuclear weapon states that signed the treaty promised that they would work towards disarmament in Article 6. Um, and I won't read this quote here from Article 6, but many Americans don't have any idea that the United States has legally committed to pursue nuclear disarmament. This treaty was completed in 1970. That was 45 years ago. Uh, and uh, it seems as though that the pace of disarmament has not kept up with that promise. The, uh, the nature of these nuclear weapons today is that they're very, um, how shall we say, they're on hair trigger alerts, um, some of them. The land-based missiles, in particular in the United States and Russia, can be launched in less than five minutes. They can reach their targets on the other side of the world within 40 minutes. Um, the submarine-launched weapons, can, depending on where the submarine is, can reach their targets even uh, faster, like 10 or 11 minutes. All during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, while they're building up these massive arsenals, they are operating under this theory of mutual assured destruction. So what that means is that one side uh, is uh, deterred from attacking the other because they know that if they did, that the, the side that was attacked could definitely, with all assurance, strike back. So both nations would be destroyed. One of the dangers of having these weapons that uh, can be launched so rapidly and are also sometimes vulnerable to attack is that if someone thinks that an attack is coming, they may want to launch on warning, meaning before the nuclear bombs actually rain down on your country, you, you launch your missiles to make sure that they get out of their silo. Um, and up to this very day, up to the, up to the year 2015, because of the continual possibility of an attack from the other side, the United States and Russia continue to keep their nuclear weapons on prompt launch status. Nuclear weapons can't be uninvented, uh, and it's obvious that terrorist groups want to get their hands on nuclear weapons. Many of the old cold warriors now believe that we should pursue a nuclear weapons-free world because on our side, Nuclear weapons cannot help deter terrorism, but in the hands of terrorists, nuclear weapons can be much, much more destructive than any other weapon they might be able to get their hands on, including airliners. So these days, um, the President of the United States and others are putting a lot of uh, emphasis on controlling weapons-grade nuclear materials. That's the key, is to deny people who would use uh, nuclear weapons for terrorist attacks we want to deny them any kind of access to the special weapons-grade nuclear materials that are very difficult to, to create. Uh, and nowadays, we have to spend a lot of time and energy and money protecting them and making sure that they can't be stolen. The problem uh, with keeping all of these nuclear weapons around, and a lot of them on um, prompt launch status, is that every day is a roll of the dice. Things do go wrong. To err is human. No complex human system can function forever without mishaps. There have been many errors regarding nuclear weapons over the years. And a lot of them show up in this book, Command and Control, written by Eric Schlosser. When I went through there and started writing in the margins, I listed 78 accidents and mishaps where something did not go the way it should with nuclear weapons in this book alone. And that was almost entirely American stuff nothing about what's going on in Russia or China or the other uh, countries that have nuclear weapons. People have misread or misunderstood what their opponents were up to. If you want to know about that, just Google the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, once the entire United States arsenal went on alert because someone screwed up and put a training tape into one of the computers. Um, they've, there have been incidents where Cruise missiles were flown all the way across the country, and the air crew had no idea that those were actual nuclear-armed cruise missiles. Um, once a technician dropped a large socket from a wrench down in a missile silo, 
It bounced around on there, penetrated the um, fuel tank of the rocket, and eventually the rocket exploded. There was an aerial refueling mishap, and a B-52 bomber broke apart in midair and dropped this bomb that you see in this picture. Um, this is a... Uh, this is a four megaton nuclear bomb that fell from that B-52 onto um, into a farm in North Carolina in 1961. And according to Eric Schlosser, all of the safety mechanisms on this bomb failed on the way down except for one. So there was only one switch that kept this bomb from going off in a four megaton explosion. Um, once uh, the United States launched a a scientific rocket from Norway. The Russians uh, weren't aware that this was going to happen. They saw it on their radar. They thought they were under attack, and they went on to alert. So as Eric Schlosser has said, when the odds of something are low, it still may happen. The problem with luck is that eventually it runs out. So just our uh, attitude about this is that we're living on borrowed time. We've been living on borrowed time for a long time now, and these uh, weapons just pose too great of a threat, uh, and it's time to get rid of them. Um, Teresa, who's our host tonight for our MC for our webinar, um, worked very hard to put together this nukes in your backyard uh, map, and you can, this is an interactive map. And you can click on this to find out on these little icons and find out uh, what happened uh, at this particular place. Uh, and so sometimes there are things that happen in history, and sometimes they are existing nuclear weapons facilities. But the point is that um, there's, a, there's been a lot of nuclear incidents in this country, and also the nuclear weapons complex is spread all around the country. Another amazing resource that's available is Nuke Map. Uh, and the URL is down here at the bottom, and it'll also show up under the resources uh, at the end of this webinar. Um, with this tool, which is online, uh, there's a professor who put this together. It's incredible. You can design your own nuclear strike. Uh, and in this case, this is a new, we're seeing a nuclear strike on the Pentagon. And then um, the computer will actually model what the results are. So in this case, this is an 800 kiloton weapon, which is uh, a typical weapon in the Russian inventory, um, with an airburst over the Pentagon. And you can see not only all the blast effects, but you can also see the plume of radiation that spreads. This is with a 15 mile per hour wind. It's really an amazing resource, and it'll teach you more than you could ever want to know about the effects of nuclear weapons. Now. PSR um, is part of the campaign to ban nuclear weapons. And this is based on um, historical precedent. Um, we have weapons that have already been banned because of their indiscriminate effects on civilians. So th there's a biological weapons ban that's currently in effect. There's a chemical weapons ban in effect. Land personnel, anti-personnel landmines have been banned. Uh, and cluster munitions have been banned. Uh, and the reason is because of indiscriminate effects on civilians. And I should say that in the case of landmines and cluster munitions, not everyone in the world has signed on to those bans. However, they have established a global norm against these weapons because they're, of their horrific humanitarian effects. We feel like nuclear weapons also have indiscriminate effects on civilians and they should be banned. Time to put them in the dustbin of history. We are working on this campaign with the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, and ICANN is a very large organization. Um, we, PSR, is one of 424 partner organizations in 95 countries that are working on this uh, campaign to ban nuclear weapons. So the um, the approach that ICANN is taking to banning nuclear weapons uh, can be explained this way. Right? They're, they're focusing on the nations that don't have nuclear weapons. So let's say that you wanted to ban smoking in public places. You know, if you wanted to establish such a ban, going to the smokers and asking them to be the first ones to sign on 
might not be the most successful strategy. Uh, I can feel that the best strategy might be to not start with the smokers in the case of nuclear weapons to go to the non-nuclear weapon states and ask them if they would get together and create a treaty to ban nuclear weapons. I think that's pretty smart. And as we've seen with the non-proliferation treaty, even though the nuclear weapon states had promised that they would move on with disarmament, it's been 45 years and they have not disarmed their weapons. In fact, since the non-proliferation treaty started, unfortunately, several nations not party to that treaty have gotten hold of nuclear weapons. Now, the battleground, the political battleground for this campaign uh, of the non-nuclear nations to ban nuclear weapons, a lot of the political battleground is going to be in Europe. Fortunately, ICANN is very powerful in Europe. This is one of their posters from the Dutch ICANN uh, campaign. And the idea is to convince the European uh, populations to get their governments to um, get behind the ban. Uh, even though uh, they have, up, up until now, they've been thinking that they're protected by American nuclear weapons. So um, since the last review conference of the Nonproliferation Treaty, this new uh, initiative has sprung up, the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons Initiative. And this is an initiative that has enjoyed a lot of support from around the world. A lot of nations have gotten on board. And this initiative reframes the debate over nuclear weapons. Instead of looking at nuclear weapons as um, a security concern, the Humanitarian Impact Initiative examines the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and examines whether or not they're acceptable. The first conference um, in the Humanitarian Impact initiative was hosted by Norway in 2013. 127 nations sent official delegations to that conference. The second one was in Mexico uh, in February of 2014, and the number of participating countries went up to 146. And then just this last year, was uh, the most exciting one of all, the third, which was the Vienna Conference on the Humanitarian Impact of, nu of Nuclear Weapons. This was in December of 2014. And we we're all really excited that 158 nations, that's something like 75, 80% of all the nations of the world participated in this conference. Uh, and among the nuclear weapons countries, India, Pakistan, the United States, and Great Britain participated. And it took a lot of pushing to get the United States to participate, but um, we were doing that in CSR and exciting, excited that they decided to participate. Um, this time there was testimony from Havakasha, which were the Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors, and also from downwinders who were affected by nuclear weapons tests in the atmosphere over the years. So those are people in the Western United States. Uh, in Asia, where uh, Russia and China were testing nuclear weapons, and in the Marshall Islands, where the United States tested nuclear weapons. We are very excited that Pope Francis delivered a statement uh, to the conference. And the most exciting part of all for us was the humanitarian pledge, which Austria was the host government, and they announced that they would be seeking um, to uh, Fill the legal gap. Uh, so where I was talking about all these other, uh, other weapons have treaties banning them, nuclear weapons do not. Austria has pledged to, to do something about that. So 2015, this, this very year, is a very special year for disarmament. That's one reason why we're doing nukebusters this year. For one thing, this is going to be the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so there's going to be a lot more attention than usual that's going to be uh, focused on that anniversary. Also, this year was every five years there's a review conference for the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and that happens this year. Um, and once again, frankly, the nuclear weapon states that are party to that treaty did not come through with their disarmament obligations, made no real uh, significant promises that they would follow through on their disarmament obligations, and partly as a result of that, 107 nations have now 
106 nations have joined with Austria on the humanitarian pledge to fill the legal gap. So we're hoping that there will be a, um, an actual conference or the beginning of a treaty process before the end of 2015. So we're looking to see we're at a crossroads here, whether we're going to keep on going the way we've been going, hoping that the nuclear weapon states will do the right thing, or whether the non-nuclear weapon states are going to you know, take the bull, up, bull by the horns and, uh, and start a treaty. The, 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 the idea is that even if the nuclear weapon states don't sign off, that the non-nuclear weapon states can get the ball rolling. And another special thing about 2015, of course, is um, our new clusters competition. And with that, I hand it back to Teresa. Thank you, Martin. So um, at this point, we will begin to go over the three different categories for the film contest. Um, I just want to point out that the grand prize will be $5,000 to a student filmmaker. Um, the student must not have graduated. The student must have graduated within a year in order to be considered a student. And then um, if the student graduated over a year ago, they would be considered in the professional filmmaker category. And that is also a prize of $5,000. And then our runner-up prizes will be for the three categories. So $1,000 for the best economic argument, $1,000 for the best health argument, and $1,000 for the best base-based argument. And these are all arguments that support um, why we need to eliminate nuclear weapons. And with that, I'll let Martin go into the details about those three categories. But, Teresa, I want to ask you a question about that student filmmaker prize of $5,000. So if I was a student and I was in college right now studying film, I would qualify as somebody Correct. who could make an entry. Is that right? Great. Yes. I hope, okay. I hope our listeners are paying attention to that. So um, in the economic film category, um, we're just trying to give you some sort of fodder, some things to think about in terms of uh, making a film. So, you know, do you like how your tax dollars are being spent? Uh, Teresa's been working with Andy Hood, who's been creating these cool comics for us. Uh, and here we see how Europe is enjoying all sorts of things. European citizens are enjoying all sorts of things that Americans don't have access to, like free health care great education, parental leave, a month of vacation, you know. And uh, over in the U.S., we're like, well, we're spending $24 billion next year on nukes. Um, you know, the, the rest of the world, the non-nuclear nations, a lot of them actually enjoy a higher standard of living than those of us do in the United States. Um, in 2014, the United States spent $18.5 billion on nuclear weapons. Look at all the things that we could have uh, spent that money on that are actually better for our country. Solar energy for 7 million households. Wind energy for 6 million households. How about Pell Grants? I went to college on a Pell Grant. Uh, $5,730 Pell Grant for 100,000 students. Um, and one-year scholarships for 75,000 students. Low-income health care for 200,000 children. And with the money that we spent last year on uh, nuclear weapons, we could have spent it on all of these things, not any one of them, but all of them. Uh, and, it, you know, going out into the future, uh, the United States is actually plan embarking on a big program to modernize all the parts of that triad I was talking about. So the land-based missiles, they want to get new land-based missiles. They want to get new bombers to replace the V-52s uh, and uh, augment the V-2s. They want to replace all of the nuclear weapon submarines, the Trident submarines. They're, they're planning to embark on a huge program for a whole new ballistic missile system. Um, the Congressional Budget Office is estimating that with the upkeep of existing nuclear weapons and all this modernization programs, uh, the government will spend $348 billion over the next 10 years on nuclear weapons, modernization, and upkeep. Um, so that's, you know, I think that's interesting material for making a film. Uh, and, you know, uh, here's Uncle Sam saying, gosh, we need a nuke to keep America safe. But what about all these other threats? 
Uh, and uh, I like the kids down in the corner. Say for what? The 1960s? Now, that was the economic category for films. And then under the health category, uh, some food for thought here about how nuclear weapons are different from other weapons. Um, this is actually a picture of um, the biggest nuclear test that the United States ever did. It was called Castle Bravo. It was in 1954. It was in the Marshall Islands. Um, this mushroom cloud reached 130,000 feet six minutes after the detonation. It created a crater that was over a mile in diameter that's still there. Uh, and nuclear fallout from this test spread over roughly 7,000 square miles. 665 inhabitants of the Marshall Islands were exposed to radiation. And to give you an idea of how nuclear weapons are different and the health impact of nuclear weapons is the story of the Lucky Dragon, which was a Japanese fishing boat, 80 miles downwind from this test. There were 23 Japanese fishermen on board that boat. They were overexposed to radiation. One of them died from the radiation and the other 22 were hospitalized for seven or eight months. Um, so there's profound health impact to these nuclear weapons, and we need to remember that the nuclear weapons are different from other normal kind of weapons. It's not really just a bigger ball. So um, these are the categories of damage from a nuclear weapon. Uh, a lot of the energy goes into blast, um, but also a lot of energy is um, uh, released as heat. And you have to realize that when a nuclear weapon is detonated, the heat at the site of where that bomb is going off is actually hotter than the interior of the sun. The sun's 93 million miles away, and think about how warm it is on a hot day. So um, the heat is truly terrific. Uh, and then the unique, really unique thing about these sorts of explosions are the radiation effects, both the fallout and the radiation that happens uh, just directly from the weapon going off. And there's yet another amazing health risk of nuclear weapons that uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and our international organization, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, um, we've come out with this report about nuclear famine. Uh, turns out that if, in the, in the case of this uh, scenario that they used for this report, uh, India and Pakistan have a war. They use, between them, they use 100 weapons that are the size of the Hiroshima weapon, so around 15 kilotons. Uh, and they use them to attack each other's cities. Now, if that were to happen, using less than 1% of the nuclear weapons in the world's arsenal, it turns out that it would have, um, it, would, it would cause a global climate change. It would cause global cooling that would uh, disrupt agriculture over the entire northern hemisphere. Um, there would be less rainfall. There would be um, soot in the stratosphere, which would cause a lowering of the temperatures uh, and more frost. Uh, less frost-free growing days for agriculture, and it turns out that the, it, the combined impact on agriculture could put up to 2 billion people at risk of starvation. And that includes people who had nothing to do with the war itself. And so uh, the chair of our security committee is Ira Helfand, and when, uh, when in a letter to the editor to the New York Times, he asked, do we see ourselves as a nation of suicide bombers? And the point of that is that since we can't use them um, because they will, um, because the impact will come back onto the United States, if we ever attacked anyone with a nuclear weapon, then we would suffer from the consequences ourselves so they don't actually help defend us. Also, PSR has been saying ever since 1962 that there is no adequate medical response um, to nuclear war. In the event of nuclear war, uh, the health facilities would be smashed because they're in the cities. Uh, the number of burn beds that, that are available would be uh, much, much less. There'd be overwhelming numbers of casualties. 
could be a loss of the medical infrastructure. And our motto at PSR is prevention is the only cure. Fortunately, also in the health film, if you're interested in making a film along the, the, um, the lines of health, um, we have some really powerful allies in the realm of health in the world. That would include our international organization, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which has 62 IPTNW affiliates around the world. IPTNW won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 for working to prevent nuclear war. Um, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement has become very involved in the humanitarian impact initiative, uh, and they passed a resolution in 2013 uh, declaring that they're embarking on a four-year action plan to work towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. So we're very excited to have the International Red Cross working on this campaign. And also the World Medical Association. Um, this year, the WMA, uh, their International Council unanimously approved a resolution calling for national medical associations to urge their respective governments to ban and eliminate nuclear weapons. So the medical community around the world is really coming together around uh, eliminating nuclear weapons. It's an exciting time. And we also have um, lots of connections with faith-based communities. Um, so this is a Martin Luther King quote, our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We have guided missiles and mi misguided men. Um, when Martin Luther King won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, you could look up his speech. He spoke uh, eloquently about nuclear weapons and how we need to get rid of them. Uh, Archbishop Tutu uh, has, um, he, this is actually a picture of him presenting at the uh, Vienna Conference via video from South Africa. And he says, nine nations still cling firmly to these ghastly instruments of terror, believing paradoxically that by threatening to obliterate others, they are maintaining the peace. Quite unaccountably, all are squandering precious resources, human and material, on programs to modernize and upgrade their arsenals, an egregious theft from the world's poor. And Pope Francis. Uh, delivered a statement to the Vienna Conference, uh, and he said that, uh, I'm convinced that the desire for peace and fraternity planted deep in the human heart will bear fruit in concrete ways to ensure that nuclear weapons are banned once and for all to the benefit of our common home. I find that uh, it's always good to have the Pope uh, weighing in uh, on your side. There's also organizations that uh, have come out strongly for the elimination of nuclear weapons, including Pax Christi International, uh, which is 100 member organizations that are active in more than 50 countries and five continents. And the World Council of Churches. Um, they have come out strongly for uh, nuclear disarmament, complete abolition of nuclear weapons. And they are representing 550 million Christians in over 120 countries. Teresa created this. Um, and, uh, you know, it's good to um, take a look at popular culture and um, use the tools that are available to communicate our messages. And those of you who don't watch South Park, that's where this came from. Uh, and so that's the end of my Nukes 101 seminar. And uh, now I think it, it would be good to um, hand it back over to Teresa, and she can tell us about, a little bit more about the Nukebusters film contest. Sure. Thanks, Martin. So um, I'll quickly go over some contest details in case you didn't get a chance yet to look at those on our website. Um, our basic rules for the film contest is that films must be one to four minutes in length. We're looking for short films, so the shorter the better. Um, films must be in English. I know some people would like it to be in a foreign language with subtitles, but we're just requesting that all films be in English. 
Um, an entrance must be legal, legal residents of the United States with a tax ID number. So there's two deadlines for entry. We're offering an early bird deadline on July 6th, and the perk to that is that we can review your film and give you some critiques if there are any critiques. And then our regular deadline will be July 31st. Um, in order to apply, you can just upload your film to Vimeo. And then we have an entry form on our website, which is at psr.org slash nukebusters. So you can fill out the entry form and submit it on that website. Next slide, please, Martin. All right, and these are some resources in case you didn't get a chance to jot them down. Um, our biggest resource page will be on our website. If you go to psr.org, you'll see a nuclear weapons a green box, and then there will be a drop down menu. From that drop down menu, you can click on resources, and that'll have pretty much everything you need to know about nuclear weapons on there. So, um, all of the maps that we showed you, um, all of the other details that we mentioned, you'll find all of that on our resources page. Um, the slide that we had about the trade off, what the $18.5 billion could have gotten you instead. That information came from a website called the National Priorities website, and they also do state-by-state -state comparisons as well, if you're interested in that. Um, we and then we have the Nuke Map website and the ICANN website. So at this point, this concludes the presentation part of the webinar, and now we'd like to open up for questions. So um, what I'll do is I'll just unmute anyone, and if you have a question, please feel free to speak up. All right, everyone should be unmuted now. Teresa, I've got a question for you. Sure. This, uh, this webinar that we just did today, uh, if somebody wants yeah. to look back through it, where could they find it? So the webinar will be listed on our Nukebusters website. That's at psr.org slash Nukebusters. And we're going to put it at the top of the page. Cool. That'll be up by tomorrow. Okay, well, it looks like um, no one has any other questions. So um, I would just like to thank everyone who attended this webinar. And if you do come up with a question later on, you can send an email to nukebusters at psr.org. That's our general email for all questions about nukebusters. Um, feel free to ask us as complex of a question as you have. Um, we'll try and do our best to answer any questions that you have about nuclear weapons or about the contest. And we hope that this webinar has provided you with the information you need to create an inspiring film about nuclear weapons. So have a great rest of your night, everyone, and good luck with your film. We're excited to we, see them. We look forward to it. Give us the best you got. <laughs> good night. Good night.